Well, good morning. Why don't you go ahead and open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 9. Or if uh, you're using the Bible app, the YouVersion Bible app, on the left side of the app, there's a place for uh, live events. You click on that, then click on search for live events, and you will find uh, this morning's notes. Uh, this past spring, uh, my mom gave her kidney to her sister. Uh, my aunt had uh, had kidney problems for a long time. Uh, my grandmother had kidney problems for a long time, and she ended up uh, dying from kidney failure. And so when my aunt came down with these kidney issues, it became a, a very big deal, among other things that were going wrong, but all back related to the kidneys. Uh, and it was a long process. Uh, I may share it one week about how God orchestrated bringing about finding someone in the family who was an exact match uh, in that whole deal. But uh, back in April uh, was the surgery, and I can remember we were sitting in the waiting room. It was down in Houston, uh, and there was quite a bit of us. I mean, uh, my family, uh, with uh, there was my mom and my dad, and I have two sisters, and then my aunt and her family, they have uh, nine children. Um, and so there's a lot of us when we get together, and we're loud, and we kind of took over the waiting room there. I'm sure people were wanting to go to different waiting rooms around that hospital. Uh, but as we're sitting there, uh, the surgery had just gotten kicked off, and a guy walked in uh, just to, to check on us in the hospital. And uh, he's an old friend of my parents. They knew him way back when. He actually went to seminary with my dad, and I could tell you some stories about them in seminary. I could tell you what. But uh, they, he came to check on us, and, and he sat with us there. I guess he didn't have a lot to do that day. He, he stayed with us the whole day. Uh, and this guy, he is a guy with a lot of personality. Uh, I'm sure you know some people with a lot of personality. And he is very funny, but he, he, he likes to talk and likes to hear himself talk, and he talks a lot. And he came, and he sat there with us. He sat in between me and my dad, and he talked to us for a long time about all kinds of stuff. Uh, he's involved in uh, the state convention, and so he was talking all kinds of church stuff because dad's in church and I'm in church. and uh, So he was talking all kinds of stuff, but then he got a little sidetracked. I started talking about this other thing because uh, he knows I have knee problems that stem from jumping off balconies and, and doing things in basketball and whatnot, and my dad has knee problems in both of his knees. And so this guy began to talk to us about our knee problems and how he has had uh, knee problems. But then he discovered this thing. It was, uh, he, it's like a, a little piece of cloth. He called it a sleeve. It's a knee sleeve that slides over your knee. And he says, it's a miracle. I never take it off except when I take a shower. We thought, thanks. We didn't want to picture that, but thank you. Uh, he said, I always wear it and it's fantastic. I don't feel any pain. I can, I can go outside and play football right now and I wouldn't feel any pain. And uh, I, don't, I don't know about you, but when it comes to things like this, I'm a massive skeptic, and I think, yeah, you just bought a load of goods, and this is, you know, you paid some money, and somebody's just taking your money and run with it. Uh, and he's sitting there telling us about this, and he, I, mean, I kid you not, he talked 45 minutes to an hour about this little piece of cloth that wraps around his knee. Uh, and then uh, once he left, my dad and I were talking, and we're thinking, yeah, okay, that thing's for real, Okay. <laughs> You know, I mean, I looked it up while we were talking, and I thought, there's no way that this thing is going to make the kind of pain that I'm feeling and the kind of pain that you're feeling and going to make it completely go away. This is just, you know, somebody on the Internet has come up with some idea to sell something, and they bought it because people on the Internet always tell the truth. And so uh, I looked it up, but then as time went on, uh, you know, driving back and forth at the time I lived in Dallas, from Dallas to Houston, uh, when my knee is stationary for some amount of time, it hurts like crazy after about 30, 45 minutes. Uh, and dri that drives about four hours or three hours, 45, depending on which section you hit just right. And, uh, uh, and so I broke down and I bought one of these things. Um, <laughs> I didn't tell anybody when I bought it because I didn't want everybody to say, why did you buy that? Come on. And so I popped this thing on and I'm driving down between Dallas and Houston and kid you not, I didn't feel any pain whatsoever. I thought, this is a miracle. Everybody needs to know about it. They need to make full body sleeves of this thing. <laughs> it is amazing. Uh, and, uh, you know, I wear it. All the, I should have worn it today. Uh, but it, it really is. It's remarkable. I don't know what they did, or maybe it's all mental, and I think it's going to work, and so it does. I don't know. But it just worked. That's all I know. Uh, I never would have known, though, about this pain relief that, Medicine hasn't been able to get rid of that. All these other things that doctors and the physical rehab, the pain's still there. 
Uh, but this little piece of cloth does it. And I never would have known about it if this guy hadn't told me about it. Even though I was skeptical, even though I didn't believe him, if, uh, if he didn't tell me about it initially, I never would have felt the pain relief. And so today in Acts chapter 9, we're going to get to see what it means to be expressive in telling somebody about pain relief of the heart. In Acts chapter 9, we come, we come upon a scene in the Christian world where things are in turmoil. The Christians are being greatly persecuted. They believe in Jesus. They believe uh, what he has done for them, dying and raising from the dead. But uh, the Jews, who have a significant amount of political power, are putting all kinds of pressure on the Christians. Uh, They're making it very difficult to be a Christian, to exercise their Christian faith, to meet together, to pray and read Scripture. And uh, the, the gang leader of this is one of the Pharisees, one of the members of the ruling council, is a young man named Saul. He was on the fast track, many scholars believe, to one day being the high priest. He had uh, the best mentor of the day as his mentor, so his resume was impeccable. And uh, he was leading the charge in arresting uh, these Christians and trying his best to make Christianity illegal. Look at Acts chapter 9, starting at verse 1. It says, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, saying that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Because you see, Saul had been arresting Christians in Jerusalem. At that point, that's really the only place he had jurisdiction. And uh, Luke, the author of the book of Acts, wrote in the previous chapter that Saul would actually go in and kick in the door of a house that he believed, where there were Christians in it, he would carry off the men and women and take them uh, to prison. And later on in the book of Acts, Paul himself, at that point, called Paul, you know, at this point he's called Saul. Uh, An interesting point about that, it's just a side note, it's not even in my notes, but uh, Saul is a Hebrew name, Paul is a Greek name. When Saul is ministering to the Jews, he is called Saul. And then when he begins to minister to the Gentiles, the people who spoke Greek, they call him by his Greek name, Paul. Same guy, two names, two different languages. And so Saul, later on in the book of Acts, when he's telling the story about his past and how bad it was, he said he would even go in, not just arresting the people, but when they were brought in for trial, he would cast his vote to have them executed. Uh, So he was a participant in their murders. So he's leading these pack of haters against the Christians. And he heard about a group of Christians who had left uh, Jerusalem at some point, or people in Damascus who had become saved, and he was going to go over there and try to arrest them and bring them back to Jerusalem, bound so that they could be put to trial and executed as well. Now Damascus, it's about a six days journey by foot away from Jerusalem. And so he has to get these papers from the high priest to take to Damascus that he would give to the authorities and tell them that he has the authority to be there and do what he's going to do. And so he wanted to arrest them, bring them back for trial. Verse 3. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And so we have Saul. He's got freshly signed papers from the high priest set out to capture Damascus Christians Uh, He was bound and determined to do harm for the movement of Christ. And now he's in the home stretch, headed up to Damascus. You know, he can see it. He's within shouting distance from the city. And a beam of light shoots out of the sky. And we find out from uh, later in the book of Acts that this light just hits Saul. It's this little light that just shoots out of the sky, uh, engulfs Saul right there on the road. And this happened during the daytime. And so this light had to be incredibly intense to, to be noticed during the daytime. It hits Saul, circles around him. Uh, and notice, though, that the light shines around Saul. He's traveling with some guys. The light doesn't touch them. Uh, it just hits Saul. And his response we get in verse 4. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you were persecuting. So Saul's instinctive reaction to this light, to this uh, feeling, is to fall to the ground. He was immediately overwhelmed by what he was experiencing. 
And he, as he indicates by his response, Paul fully understands that he is encountering God, or at least a messenger from God. He calls him Lord. And the way in which he says it, he's not talking about, he's not saying it like, uh, who are you, sir? He's saying, Lord, who are you, divine messenger, to come here and talk to me? You see, when, when faced with the greatness of God, one can only be humbled. And Saul wants to know when he says, who are you? Who is this person who is making this accusation against me, saying, I am persecuting them? Who is this person? And then Jesus reveals himself to me. I am Jesus. Three words. Now, I tried to put myself in, in, in Saul's shoes, trying to understand what might have been going through in his mind here. You know, he had been arresting and executing Christians under the assumption that Jesus was, in fact, dead. And now he's confronted by the very much alive Jesus, surrounded by the glory of God, and everything that he had been attesting to and fighting for were in those three words, I am Jesus, found to be a lie. He thought Jesus was dead. He thought the, the guy that these people believed in was dead. And now he, this guy that he thought was dead is standing in front of him. Everything must have been bouncing around in his head. All kinds of confusion. All kinds of craziness as Jesus is standing there talking to him. Verse 6, Jesus continues talking. He says, but rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. So Saul is dumbfounded. He doesn't say anything. After this, after he says, who are you? He doesn't say anything. Jesus gives him specific instructions. He's supposed to go into town and then he'll get further instructions. He's not given a list of instructions, not a to-do list. You know, not, uh, he didn't make up a list on the reminders on his phone like when you go to Walmart here. He is, is just told, go to the city and then you'll get the next step. He's just told step one. He doesn't get step two through 99, just step one. And then once he takes that step, he would be told what to do next. Verse 7. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And so Saul's traveling companions, possibly hired muscle as they head into Damascus, they're amazed as well. They didn't hear the specifics of the conversation. Uh, when uh, Saul tells us later in the book of Acts, uh, they just heard some sort of mumbling noise. Uh, they didn't hear the specifics, uh, they just saw the light, heard some uh, vocal conversation, didn't know what was going on, but they're flabbergasted by, by this thing. They saw the light and understood that something supernatural is taking place. And God moved mightily in the life of Saul here. I mean, he's on the road, God is moving, uh, Jesus is speaking to his heart, he's feeling God's presence and those close to him there on the road turn out to be collateral damage in the wake of the rushing of God, just by their proximity to Saul. Verse 8, Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So Saul had this experience with God, and he is blinded. His experience with Jesus affected him physically. He had been so consumed with pride and hatred as he led these men towards Damascus, and now he is faced with complete humility as they lead him into Damascus. He had been in spiritual darkness before, and now his physical life was, was catching up to his spiritual reality. He was spiritually blind, now he's physically blind blind and the shock of what he had encountered heard and seen led him to a fast he couldn't eat he couldn't drink he couldn't see he was just sitting in this house waiting for what was going to happen next and now what we got to understand with with Saul is that he uh, was at that point being rescued God was extending his hand, uh, attempting to rescue him, offering him a rescue attempt in that moment. Because no one is ever too far from God for him to grab a hold of. Years ago, uh, we had a, uh, back when I was a, a student ministry associate, we had a retreat. Uh, it was in the fall, and uh, it, was, it was quite cold. 
Uh, but it was in the fall, it was over the weekend, it was a Friday night, all day Saturday, and then we would drive back Sunday morning to be back in time for church. Uh, you know, and, and going anywhere with, with students for a few days in the middle of the woods is just insanity, uh, just craziness. Uh, but this particular trip, there was one girl that was giving us all kinds of trouble. Just the way she was acting, the things she was saying, uh, it was just very difficult. And then we discover that she brought several weapons on the trip. Uh, but it wasn't to do harm to anyone else. She was a cutter, and she would cut herself with these uh, weapons. And we confiscated what we could find, uh, but then we discovered later on that she had more. Uh, this was a, a response to, to her home life. It was not good at all, uh, as well as the way she had been treated at school uh, peers and teachers, uh, and uh, she was acting out of a response to that, but not just that, she was running from God, she was fleeing God, and this, this one act was just a piece of how she was fleeing from God, she was fleeing from God in her physical activities uh, with the other gender, she was fleeing from God in her disrespect uh, towards uh, any kind of authority, but somehow God brought it on her heart to bring her this weekend and throughout the weekend, you could tell God was working on her. She was really struggling during those uh, worship services we were having uh, during the small group times. And then the Saturday night came. It was the last service of the retreat. And uh, God was working on her, and she came back to the back where several of the leaders were, and she spoke with me and another one of the leaders uh, that she was really convicted about what she had been doing, about how she had been uh, fleeing from God, and she wanted to give that up as well as she wanted to, to stop the cutting. And she brought us the last of her sharp objects and handed them to us and prayed with us. And she repented. Uh, and the evening concluded. We passed out T-shirts to everybody because that's what you do in student ministry. You get T-shirts for everything. And so we passed out T-shirts. And then uh, we all went to bed in our cabins. And the next morning, uh, I got up with another uh, one of the leaders. And we drove back to the church to get stuff set up early. And then when the students got there, what uh, they got there, and it was, remember, it's cold. And so everybody is wearing, uh, you know, we spent all this time designing T-shirts, and they wear hoodies and jackets over them so you can't even see them. And so they're all, uh, you know, warmed up, walking in. But this girl uh, who had been having trouble didn't wear her jacket. She's just wearing her T-shirt, and she comes running in. She's the first one out of the vans, the first one running in, arms extended. Look, look. Every one of her scars was gone. Unbelievable. She, I mean, it, I, I, I was speechless. I saw it, and I said, I don't know, okay, wow, God still does miracles, you know? God had not just rescued her spiritually, God had healed her physically in a way that she had never experienced before. God uh, can reach out to anyone. No one is ever too far gone for God to grab a hold of. No one can ever outrun the reach of God. God, he created this planet so there is nowhere for us to hide from his extended love. His hand is outstretched, ready to receive any and all who would come to him. You see, Saul was a murderer, and yet Jesus reached out to him specifically. He desires to reach out to anyone and everyone who would take his hand in return. And so Saul, he's in the city, he's wrestling with his thoughts in Damascus, and God came to pay a visit to another particular specific Christian also in Damascus. Look at verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. Now the thing about Ananias is this is the only story we have about him. We know nothing else about him besides what we have in these few verses. And every indication from these verses and his response to God shows us that he is a faithful Christian. He's just a regular Christian guy, but he is faithful to God. Uh, he's just ordinary, but God decides to use him in an extraordinary way. He followed God without reservation. And he must have been excited hearing from God. I mean, how many of you at first probably scared, but if you're sitting by yourself and you hear God say your name out loud, uh, you, oh, hey, God's talking to me. He must have something important for me to do. And so this guy gets a little encouraged. I mean, God's talking to me, just like in the Old Testament stuff. This is cool. He says, Ananias. And Ananias responds, here I am, immediately. He doesn't hesitate. He doesn't try to rationalize, okay, you know, 
right, those tacos I had for dinner are just making me hear stuff. This isn't God. Uh, he, he immediately says, here I am. He is in a place with God that he knows the sound of his voice. Here I am. And then God gives him instructions. Verse 11. The Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. So God gives Ananias some very specific instructions. He tells him to go to a house on Straight Street. And once he's there, he's going to find a guy named Saul. And now Saul's name at this day and time was very well known. Because of what he had been doing in Jerusalem. Because of who he was in the Jewish faith. And the fact that he was coming to Damascus, all of that was very well known, especially to a man like Ananias, who was a Christian, knowing that this man was coming to arrest and possibly kill him. And yet God is telling Ananias to go over and see the very man who would have had him killed. But then God says something interesting. You see, as though to alleviate any fear that Ananias might have about confronting Saul, he tells him that Saul is praying. Saul is in this house and he is praying. As though to say, that's my stamp of approval. He's praying. That's an act of a Christian. That's an act of a believer. That's an act of a humble person. Uh, that's an, that describes his character at this point according to God speaking to Ananias. God used the description of Saul's prayer to talk about somebody serving his purposes. You see, how can we, though, be, be attributed to serving God's purposes if we don't first begin in prayer? Prayer is a foundation that builds, that our, the rest of our life builds upon. If we're not communicating with God, what are we doing? I remember several years ago speaking with a pastor. Uh, we met several times uh, uh, over the course of a six-month period, you know, a couple times a month. Uh, and one time I asked him, he'd been a pastor now for over 50 years, a very godly man. He, he led a church. He was at one church for 34 years alone. And God did great things through him, saw many people come to Christ under his leadership. And I asked him, this very godly man uh, who would die a year later, I said, if you could do one thing different over the course of your entire ministry, what would you do? And I'm thinking, you know, program elements. I, I would have done this longer. I would do that. I would preach more about this uh, and what he said was, I would pray more. It's, it, it struck me. This man, who was one of the most godly men I know, said, I would pray more, spend more time communicating with the Father. And so here we have Saul praying. God is saying, Saul's praying. It's all good. Don't worry about it. And so Ananias hears that, and then God it says something else to Ananias. Ananias is already thinking, okay, you want me to go talk to Saul? That's difficult. Maybe, you know, tomorrow I can get up the courage and I can go do it. But then God says this, verse 12. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. So God tells Ananias, I already told him you're coming, so you might as well go. It's not like God said, go and think about it, you know, build up your courage, put it on your checklist, make sure you, you hit the appointment tomorrow night at like 6 o'clock, that gives you 24 hours to figure this thing out. No, God said, I already told him you're coming, so you might as well go, just pop your shoes on and head over there. You know, Ananias starts to freak out a little bit, I mean, turmoil, right? I mean, this guy who was coming to town to kill him, and now God says, I want you to go talk to him. Okay, God, um, this is a hard thing for me to do, okay? You know, it's me, it's my family, he's going to kill me. This is, he could jump the second I come in, hands around my throat business. This is not good. Thanks for that, God. Uh, but then Ananias, you know, we know he's faithful. We know at the same time he's an ordinary Christian. He expresses his heart in a transparent and honest way to God. Verse 13, Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. How much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. So Ananias is expressing his concern and his fear. He doesn't say, Ananias doesn't say, I'm not going to do it. He just says, God, this scares me a little bit. You see, the thing is, God already knows our hearts and the feelings that we have. So it's always best to be honest and upfront with him. Because he already knows what we're thinking and feeling. You can't trick God. 
So Ananias is, is basically wondering, why would God send him to a man who has done nothing but hinder the working of God? Why are you sending me there, God? He came here to kill me. Why do you want me to go see him? But then God says to him, verse 15, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. You see, God intended much for the life of Saul, but Ananias first had to act. Up until now, for the most part, mainly Jews had heard about the death and resurrection of Jesus, with a few exceptions. And so God has a plan to get the news out to the rest of the world, and it begins with this man, Saul. So God wanted to use an ordinary guy like Ananias to launch the revolutionary missionary career of Saul. God uses the ordinary to produce the extraordinary. Verse 16. God tacks on this last line. I find this very interesting. He says, For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And now we know Ananias' heart. I mean, if it were me, I would be thinking, well, then I'll go tell him. He's going to suffer. He needs to know. He's killed a bunch of Christians. Hey, God wants you to do a lot of things for him. By the way, you're going to suffer a lot. Uh, but that's not what's going on with Ananias, uh, as far as we can tell from the passage. Uh, he's not, it doesn't have malicious intent in his uh, heart here. Uh, this, what God says, though, that he will suffer much for the sake of my name, this serves to indicate that the primary source of intense persecution, Saul, would become a willing recipient of the very same persecution. He would flip sides from inflicting it to being willing to take it because of his service to God. So Ananias hears this, verse 17. Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And now, remember, Saul's been fasting for three days. And if you've ever been on a fast, it first is incredibly difficult. But in addition to that, it's like a spiritual superpower. It heightens your spiritual sense in a way you wouldn't ever believe. And so Saul is in there, and he is primed, and he is ready spiritually for whatever God is about to do to him. And so Ananias walks in and says, Brother Saul. He refers to Ananias as a brother, as an equal, as a fellow believer. This is the first time anyone's ever called Saul this. Not only that, he mentions being filled with the Holy Spirit. And we know from Saul's own writings later in his life that every believer has the Holy Spirit. The moment you get saved, you get God's Spirit. But the level in which you have it from then on is dependent upon your own willingness if you want to be filled with the Spirit, you have to be willing to be filled with the Spirit, willing to remove other things that are in the way so that God's Spirit can fill you up. And so we have Ananias talking about this. He came and witnessed the working of God on this, this man, Saul. He witnessed God do something that he never thought uh, God would have done. Look at verse 18. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. <clears throat> and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And so now Saul, having believed in Jesus, leaving the spiritual darkness, he also left his physical darkness behind as well. Once he believed, though, the first thing he wanted to do was be baptized. Not only here, Jesus tells us that. In Matthew 28, uh, go and make disciples and baptize them. Step one in being a Christian, after you believe, is be baptized. And so Saul goes to be baptized. But remember, too, he hadn't eaten in three days. I don't know about you, but I like food. I'm already thinking about what I'm having for lunch. And I like to prepare myself for what I'm going to have. And so uh, Saul, though, hadn't eaten for three days. But he doesn't think, okay, my, my stomach is imploding on itself. But I'm not going to eat yet. Let's go and take care of my spiritual business first. He says, let's go get baptized before anything else happens. I want to be baptized because that is spiritual. That is what God desires. That is obedience. And so Saul goes out and he gets baptized. That demonstrates that he now belongs to Jesus. Baptism isn't necessary for salvation, but it's a demonstration of what happens in our hearts 
going under the water, dying to selfishness and sin that uh, reigned in our life before. Coming out of the water represents getting a brand new life to live for Jesus. And so after he believes and he is baptized, then he gets food and he's strengthened and he hangs out with the Christians there for a little while. But all of that was dependent upon the resolute attempt of Ananias to bring the gospel to Saul. You see, God told Ananias what to do. And even in the midst of his fear, he was resolute in his obedience. You see, we never know how our message of hope about Jesus will affect someone else's life. And we never know who that person might become in service to God. Ananias had no way of knowing that Saul would go on to do such great things for God in the future. We were simply told by Jesus to go with intentionality to tell whomever we come across about his death and resurrection. It's not up to us to do the rescuing. It's merely our job to use our words to tell people about God's rescue. And so Saul had just believed in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Then he's baptized. Okay, what now? He was on the road. Uh, God said, go to, go to Damascus. Wait until I come. He goes to Damascus. Uh, brings Ananias, gets saved, gets baptized. Okay, what's the next step that God has for him? Look at verse 20. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And so Saul's response to his belief is a standard by which he would live the rest of his life. He experiences Jesus, he believes in him, and he cannot help but go out and tell other people. You see, Luke wrote the book of Acts, and he gets this information about him immediately going out directly from Saul. Saul immediately went out and told people about Jesus. He didn't wait until he knew more. He didn't wait until he had studied more. He didn't wait until he felt like it. It just says, immediately. He never, you know, he he saw the people who were standing out there. He said, I would never have the opportunity to reach these exact same people. And so he seized that chance. And anything that would deter a person from telling people about Jesus is not from God. If somebody, you know, if Saul had in his inner rumbling started to think, you know, I need to know a little bit more before I tell them about Jesus. You know, I need to spend a little more time and study. You know, I'll I'll go tomorrow and I'll tell them about Jesus. They they might still be there tomorrow. You know, I, I need to get to know them a little bit better before I tell them about Jesus. No, it says immediately, just like Jesus said, go and make disciples. Going, as you go, make disciples. Go out there and do it. Tell people about me. He doesn't say, wear a t-shirt that says, Jesus saves. Oh, that's a good thing, especially if it's a really comfy shirt. But he he says, go out there and tell people. That's that's words. That's using your, your vocal ability to tell them about Jesus. I mean, how many people do you think have gotten saved because of a bumper sticker? First of all, if they're close enough to read all the words on your bumper sticker, you probably got bigger issues, and you're probably not having the spirit in which you need to be telling them about Jesus. Uh, but uh, if you have a Jesus bumper sticker, drive better, please. I mean, just. Uh, and so Saul goes out there, and he immediately tells people. Doesn't wait, doesn't hesitate, just goes and tells them. Verse 21. And all who heard him were amazed. And said, is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? Now what's interesting about this is that people often cannot understand the change that Jesus can evoke on the heart of a person. God can take the most hardened and unrepentant heart and completely convert it into something usable for the person who is willing Jesus' effect on our lives should be so evident that the people around us cannot help but exclaim it. You see, Saul was just living out what he felt Jesus doing inside of him. And the unbelievers he was encountering said, isn't this the same guy? He's he's completely different. They couldn't help but notice the change that had occurred because of Jesus in his life. Uh, Look at verse 22. But Saul increased all the more in strength. And confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. He had spiritual strength building. But spiritual strength building is completely dependent upon spiritual strength training. 
Training only makes a significant difference when it's utilized on a daily basis. I have an elliptical machine in the corner at my house. I use it maybe once every other week. Maybe that's why my knee hurts so bad. I don't do it as much. Uh, it's just sitting there. If it just sits there, it's not going to do any good. It's not going to do any good unless I utilize it. The same is true with spiritual matters. If we don't utilize the spiritual training that God has given us, this, this book that tells us how to live for him and do for him on a daily basis, then we're not growing as we should be growing. We're not being utilized by God in the way he intends us to be utilized because we're not strong enough. So Saul grew in strength because of the time he invested in building that relationship with God. And so what had happened here is Saul was, was revealing the truth of the gospel, revealing what God had done to him, revealing it to those uh, he came in contact with. He was giving out uh, a revealing attempt of what God could do. He was attempting to reveal to these people God's rescue. And if you are a Christian today, you're a Christian because somebody told you about Jesus at some point in the past. Someone attemp attempted to make a difference in your life by telling you how to experience heaven. So what if somebody never told you about Jesus? How would your life be different today? And think about that in terms of other people. You saw the stat on that video earlier. 50%, half of the people not connected to church. Of those 50%, the vast majority not being believers. I mean, think about it too, in terms of people who actually go to church, most of them are, not, not say most of them, most of them are believers, but some of them aren't. Some of the people sitting in this room are not Christians. And so if we have, we're surrounded by all of these non-Christians and we don't tell them how to be saved from eternal punishment and pain, they're going to experience that forever. And we don't tell them. Even though we've had the opportunity, Saul, this man, actually wrote in Romans chapter 10. He said, how will these people call on Jesus in whom they have not believed? And how will they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without someone telling them? See, all we can do is communicate to someone that God rescues by bringing them to Jesus. That's our responsibility, telling them. That is our assignment from Jesus himself, telling them about Jesus. And you may say, man, this telling thing, people about Jesus, this is hard. You know, I get scared. I don't know what they're going to think. I don't know how they're going to respond. Uh, this is bad news. I may lose my job. And so we start thinking in terms of this. But the thing is, Jesus left no plan B. He didn't say, uh, you know, if you don't do it, you know, I'm going to drop a little card in the mail and I'm going to send it to them that will explain everything. Uh, Jesus didn't say that. This was his only plan was for the people who do believe to tell other people who don't. That was it. There's no other way, there's no other strategy, that's all that he planned to do. And he gave it to his 11 disciples who were alive after Judas uh, died. Uh, he said, you 11 guys who have failed repeatedly, go. And then Jesus went to heaven. And they had to go and tell people. And among the, the people who believed was this man Saul who would go and tell multitudes of people. You see, the only way that people will know the eternal rescue attempt is by our words, by us telling them. That's Jesus' plan. Everybody has to start somewhere. I mean, we all come in contact with unbelievers at some point or another, whether it's going to the store, whether it's going to the doctor, uh, whether it's talking to someone on the phone. Uh, we encounter unbelievers all the time. Uh, and so what I would challenge you to do is to begin to think about right now listing them in your head. Unbelievers you know or people you don't know their eternal uh, future. You don't know whether they believe or not. But they are people that God has placed in your life and you can have an influence on them. Think about these people and think about and uh, begin to pray about this week even God giving you the opportunity to tell them about Jesus. Some of you, you're starting to get anxious like, oh my. I need to avoid that person this week. This is going to be really hard. Uh, but you need to, to pray for the strength. And the, this is a difficult thing for everybody. 
to tell people about Jesus because that's the way Satan designed uh, his strategy is to make us scared and to make us fearful so that we won't go out and do what Jesus specifically told us to do. And this morning, if, if you have come and you don't know Jesus, we would love to talk to you about that in a moment that he came and died and rose from the dead to rescue you from eternal pain and punishment and getting to go to heaven. If you want to come and believe that this morning, we would invite you in just a moment. I'm going to pray. Music's going to play. And we invite you to come. If, like Saul, you need to be baptized, you have believed and haven't been baptized after you believed, come and we'll talk to you about it and we'll get that done. Uh, if you want to come and join the church, become a member of the church. Acts is all about the founding of the church, people becoming involved in the church for the first time, uh, being intentional about the way God has gifted them. We want you to do that. Uh, come, and we'll talk to you about that as well this morning. God has a specific plan for each of you. Uh, you need to pray and, and help, uh, ask for God's help in bringing you to full usability uh, in his plan.